Ajahn Brahm, thank you so much for making time for this conversation. And I'd like the conversation to focus around the topic of enlightenment. Ah. Most, yes, because most Buddhist traditions regard the full moon in May as commemorating the enlightenment of the Buddha. Supposedly, when the ascetic Siddhartha Gautama sat under the medit sat in meditation under the Bodhi tree, and had that transformative spiritual experience, and it was only after that that he was called the Buddha. Do you think this was an actual event, and what does it mean to you? Oh yes, very much an event. Sometimes you can actually say the time, the place and the why and what happens afterwards. Because what, some years ago, when I was uh, a teaching in Singapore, I was asked to teach at a, a, a little youth group. It was more a youth group, it was more like a, a, a kindergarten school. And when I found out I was supposed to teach there around the subject of Waisak, that uh, I realized I was going to be teaching four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds. And it's a very hard thing to teach Dhamma to such a young age. But I thought that one thing which children are very good at is using their visualization, their imagination. And they'd all seen the descriptions of the Buddha's birth. And you know, part of that was when they, he supposed to have walked seven steps and put his finger up and said, this is my last life, I'm the best in the world, as he was predicting his own enlightenment. And I got all the kids to, to do that. Okay, now just pretend you're the Buddha being born, and as you walk your seven steps and put one finger up, not that finger, put the, the correct finger up. <laughs> and all the kids love doing that. And then, okay, now the next thing is the Buddha's enlightenment. So you can see the big statue over there, the Buddha sitting down. All of you sit down and cross your legs and close your eyes. And then I got them to imagine what it must be like to be free of all desires, all ill will, no worries, no concerns in the world. And of course, I was doing that with them. And it was an amazing that you could start to almost get that, what they call the taste of freedom. You have nothing left to do in the whole world. You've got no worries for the future, no business to be done no sort of uh, trauma or pain from the past. You're completely free. Imagine you're sitting in Bodh Gaya. In those days, it would be so peaceful, so calm. You're sitting on this wonderful shady tree. You've had a wonderful breakfast you know, from uh, Lady Sujata, and there's a river running close by, and everything's so peaceful and safe and calm. And now you let go of all desires and cravings, all ill will, all sort of dullness, you're just sitting there totally at peace with the world, with the realization that peace is not going to go anywhere, it's not going to diminish. That peace is settled there, peace forever, nothing more to be done in the whole world. Like at times you feel you've been working very hard, and you go home, you can sit down and just really relax to the max. And everyone feeling all of that, even the kids got into it. And they sat there so peacefully, about 10 or 15 minutes, these very young ones. But what really surprised me was all of the teachers and the parents were there at the same time. So wonderful. Can we please do that again? So that evening, <laughs> I did it for the grown-ups a bit longer. Just almost imagining, visualizing, feeling. You're just fully enlightened with nothing to do left in the whole world. Totally at peace. Free and really getting a taste of what that freedom really means. And that was, instead of intellectualizing it, that was actually emotionally feeling it. And the kids led the way there. They could really get into it, understand what it must be like to be free of all this business we have to do, all these mistakes which we have to fix up, all this fear of the future, what might go wrong. Imagine that for being fully enlightened, no fear left at all. Nothing which needs to be changed or needs to be done. Totally at peace for the whole world, the future, the past, everything. That's really deep. Well, I must say that does sound, of course, 
beautiful and certainly very desirable. But what did he actually realize? I mean, what happened that so changed him, that allowed him to be, feel that permanently? Well, it was, you see, the letting go of all desires, even temporarily, to let all those disappear and realize what is it you want in this world, even to be kind to others and to serve other people. What do they really need? What they really need is to actually to feel that sort of peace, that stillness inside of them. And that's what we did with the meditation. The meditation of very deep letting go of everything you ever want, everything you want to change, everything you want to attain. And of course, you know, you're also a really good friend when we were monks together with Ajahn Shah. And Ajahn Shah would always say, we meditate not to attain things, but to let go of things. And this is actually getting a very deep taste of what happens when you really let go of everything. And you don't do it, you let go of even the person who's letting go. Everything just disappears and vanishes, and it's not a nothing left, it's just a peace, a deep peace, fantastic joy and happiness. It's the default state of the mind. It's not what you do, it's what happens when you stop doing things. And you really stop. Well, that sounds, again, it, it, beautiful. it sounds beautiful. <laughs> and I, the thing is, I mean, people can't, it was obviously something extraordinary that it, he was able to do that very no. few others can do. <laughs> he didn't do it at all. <laughs> it's what happens when you stop doing things. So an important part of that is you have to feel safe. No, it was a beautiful situation he was um, sitting in under a Bodhi tree. And those Bodhi trees, beautiful leaves, and probably enhanced the oxygen in the air around him. He had a very a meal which was actually fit for a heavenly being in the morning. And it was calm, peaceful. No one was there to disturb him. And it was almost an exquisite garden where he was uh, sat down in. So safe, comfortable. And that allowed you to sit there and don't do anything. Just to sit and be peaceful. Don't even, well, I get into trouble when I say such things, but don't even try to watch the breath. Don't even try to do anything. Just sit down, close your eyes, and let it be. Or if you say what we're going to be doing is that second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samasankapa which is uh, renouncing, renouncing Nekama Sankapa, renouncing all of whatever you want to do, whatever you want to get, whatever you want to gain, total letting go, and kindness and gentleness. Very soft practice, not an aggressive practice. And that's the, I always call the second factor of the eight or four path these days, right motivation. You just, where are you coming from? What are you doing this for? It's not to gain things, not to get rid of things but to care for this moment. There's beautiful kindfulness. And soon, them, it's like, you know, if I'm ever kind and smile at you, John, and you end up smiling back at me. <laughs> That's general. You smile at your body, at your mind or whatever, and it kind of metaphorically smiles back at you. And you feel this wonderful connection, and that connection means you don't have to do anything. It's totally still and peaceful. And that peacefulness and stillness just develops. And I say to feel safe where you are is because otherwise we always tend to be control freaks, always worried about what might go wrong. Because of that control freak business, we're trying to control everything. We forget about the power of caring. Caring is not controlling, just being here and feeling it's very, very, very safe and also very beautiful. You don't have to do anything. Ah, oh, it's wonderful when you're at peace. You bliss out. And you can't stop the bliss. <laughs> you don't make it happen. You don't try to get rid of it. It just happens. Because that's the nature of a mind which is still and peaceful. Well, still, it doesn't sound, um, you know, it, it just doesn't sound 
extraordinary in the sense that I can understand that. I can actually understand and appreciate that. And, you know, as you say, get a, a glimpse or a few, uh, you know, a certainly a, a taste of what it could be like. But it's for most people, that is all it is, is just an appreciation of something that is wonderful and possible. But if I'm correct, the Buddha actually was able to live that, um, and which is quite exceptional, I would think. Well, sometimes if you experience that deeply enough, that is, again, I keep using the word default state, that's how things stay when you don't go out and do anything. And I mentioned this, that according to the Buddhist tradition, as we learned it, that there was uh, this gentleman called Brahma Sahampati who actually asked the Buddha to teach. And uh, when the mind is so still and peaceful, it cannot form any motivations at all, any, any will, any decisions. It is still. And so what happens is when Sahampati, who was, according to the suttas, if we take this, uh, this, this particular episode as true, Sahampati was a fellow monk with, in the Buddha's uh, previous life, when the Buddha in his previous life was Jyotipala. And uh, that's in the Gatikara Sutta. I don't make these things up. And that, that was Sahampati. They were fellow monks in a previous life together. And Sahampati was an, an anagami, so he was born in the uh, Sudawasa, and he came to us to ask the Buddha, please teach for the benefit of all beings. You know, that's all you need, just a little seed, or rather just a little water, a little request, and that was enough to turn uh, Siddhartha Gautama, now fully enlightened, from being a, uh, what they called a Pacheka Buddha, into a, a full Buddha. You could teach for all beings. Well, at this, around the same time as the Buddha lived, from what I understand, there were many other spiritual teachers, uh, samanas and ascetics, uh, who were very dedicated to spiritual practices and uh, you know, striving for um, enlightenment. And, and, and many of them claimed to have attained uh these this their enlightenment were they the same or as the buddha or were they people mistaken yes it's obviously that many people even today are very mistaken when they sort of claim to be fully enlightened and a lot of times it is because of um, uh, it is looked upon as being an attainment rather than just a sense of self, the ego, everything which does stuff and claims to have stuff just disappears. A different state of mind. And uh, in the time of the Buddha, there's one thing which I always remind people, is that uh, there was uh, one of the Buddha's disciples, Chitta the householder, who was actually a general, but he was a lay person. And he'd become an anagami, non-returner, but he went to see uh, the leader of the Jains. When he went to see the leader of the Jains, the Jains they were having a discussion about can you make your mind still enough, peaceful enough, that there's no, uh, like, no thoughts in it, no vitaka vichara. And uh, the leader of the Jains at the time, and Yataputta, just asked, Jitta said, you're a a chief disciple, a lay disciple of the Buddha, now, do you believe you know, that uh, you could uh, make your mind so still there's no thoughts in it? And Chitta said, no, I don't believe that at all. And the leader of Jain says, there, yeah, see, even one of the, the most uh, revered and renowned disciples of the Buddha doesn't believe that rubbish. You can't stop the thoughts in your mind. No more you can put your fist in the river Ganges and stop the current. It just can't be done. And that's when Chitta said, I don't believe it because I know it. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. I meditate. That's what happens. The mind becomes very still, not a thought in there for hours. But very aware, deeply aware. And to me, 
you know, that was a little bit of humor in the Buddhist uh, tradition at the time, uh, recorded in the suttas. But also it reminded me that even the leader of the biggest spiritual tradition, some people say it was even more popular at the time than, uh, than the Buddha's teachings. Even Nataputta didn't realize that he could stop all those thoughts and be peaceful. Had no experience of that. So it was sort of a, a discovery of the Buddha. Of course, jhanas had been um, there in India before, but at that time when the Buddha was uh, practicing and, and becoming uh, you know, the Buddha, I don't think it was very prevalent. It was one of the reasons why when the Buddha uh, recalled the experience of jhanas, he never recalled the experience of any jhana under a Lara Kalama, Uddha Kalama Buddha. It was just when he was a kid, six or seven years of age, under a rose apple tree. Very peaceful mind, nothing, not striving at all. Six or seven year old kids don't strive. <laughs> I've never seen them striving. It was relaxing, resting, letting go. It's the opposite of striving. And a scary thing to do is not strive. So that is the, that stillness and silence that you're speaking about there sounds like a, a state of meditation. Correct, yeah. Would you equate that as nirvana? <laughs> no. You could say that as the experience of nirvana. Or experience like a taste of nirvana. A taste of freedom. Or even, I know just one thing which I noticed when, and it inspired me, it gave me goosebumps when I first read this, when I learned Pali. And you had all the descriptions, the Buddha's descriptions of the jhanas. And one of the descriptions of the first jhana was the Sambodhi Sukha. And you know the word Sambodhi, that means enlightenment. He said, the experience you have even in the first jhana, is the experience of enlightenment happiness. It's not enlightenment, but you really get a taste of what it must be like. Peace, stillness, bliss. And so what is Nibbana then? Nibbana is things ceasing and disappearing. That is one of the reasons why that uh, the Buddha used that word, Nibbana, but it was not, uh, it was not uh, always a metaphysical word because it was used in daily life. And uh, we have one of the great charts, which we do. I was charting this yesterday, yesterday afternoon, and it was a beautiful chart. I get inspired by this chanting. I know what it means. And that was the Ratana Sutta. And it's the last part of the Ratana Sutta, Nibbana, Dira, Yatayang, Pradipo. And then this flame is going to Nibbana. I know, so a person who's practicing the, the, uh, the Eightfold Path will experience Nibbana, just as a flame in an oil lamp would experience Nibbana. It will go out. It will cease to be extinguished. It won't be there anymore. And that's consistent with everything else which the Buddha taught in those uh, authentic early suttas. So it's like this similarly, if you have, say, not an oil lamp, but a candle. And the flame of the candle, it depends on three causes. The wick, the heat, and the wax. And if any one of those is exhausted, in other words, there's no more wax, there's no more um, wick, or there's no more heat, you blow the flame out. Where does the flame go? It doesn't go anywhere. It's just caused by three causes. When those causes are extinguished, so does the flame become nibbana extinguished. And that's how the Buddha taught uh, about enlightenment. Uh, so he ex obviously experienced this yeah. during his life, after his enlightenment. That's what his enlightenment was, that he 
lived and experienced this all the time, would you say? Yeah. In other words, but remember that's what uh, they call the enlightenment with the five candles remaining. So in other words, his body and mind were still continuing on until that on Waysak, one of the experiences there, which people always forget, I always think is the most important, the most inspiring, was when the Buddha went uh, uh, to Kusinara. That's where he passed away. And that was called the full Nibbana, Pari Nibbana, and the complete Nibbana. And that was the most inspiring because then he'd finished his job. He'd only carried on for the sake of teaching others, for the sake of helping others, being a good example to others. But being a good example to others means you have to practice what you teach. And that was the most inspiring at the very end. And this, when I lay down and passed away never to return, to go out, thrown out like a flame. And people said, well, what do you do that for? He could have still been teaching. And that was a great teaching. And every time one of the monks, or even myself, just wants to go on a, a long retreat, you know, whether it's a six-month retreat or a two-week retreat or three years retreat, and people say, oh, no, you should be teaching. And all the people I'm close to always say, no, please take that retreat. Because that's a teaching in itself. That's inspiring. Mm -hmm. You're not just uh, a person who just gets up on a, in front of a microphone and just spouts so this word and that word and this idea and that idea. You actually show that you know, you know what practice is and you can just sit there and be so still and peaceful. Mm. So for the Buddha, just totally disappearing. It was teaching by example, not just teaching by words. Lovely. Now, I, I have read and uh, I understand that one of the definitions for nirvana or nibbana that the Buddha gave himself and also um, his disciples was that it was a complete eradication, if I'm correct, of greed, hatred, and delusion. But I have heard it also said that, you know, these things may arise, but the Buddha would just know them and not attach to them, and therefore they're not significant. I mean, how can one explain the eradication or the complete cessation of greed, hatred, and delusion. You don't want anything. What do you want anything for? What's the cause of greed? What's the cause of ill will? A lot of it, it comes from the idea of, well, there's a self in here which needs something, which wants something. Or, you know, that you can get upset by something. That's one of the reasons why <laughs> the usual way that... Uh, we test out somebody who thinks they're uh, enlightened or got a deep meditation. It's, you know, knows great little teaching. We try and make them upset. Now, please listen to this completely uh, because sometimes I can get criticized when people listen to this half and then they just criticize me for being misogynist. Because sometimes when a woman comes up to me and says, oh, they've got a deep stage of enlightenment, I say to them, nah, because women can't become enlightened. It's impossible, not these days. No, women can't become enlightened. And I wait to see the reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and if that female, I say, you can't say that. That is misogynist. We had great faith in you, Ajahn Brahm. That's really wrong. You know, we're going to report you to the authorities for being misogynist. And I say, well, of course women become enlightened, but because when women do become enlightened, they, they don't respond like that at all. That's what we usually do is to try and make find some weak points in them and try and make sure that they uh, have no ill will, no anger, no fear. And that's a sign that uh, they've actually achieved something or they've experienced something. You know that, um, I don't know if I told you this, uh, John, you know my precept of Sambhut Buddha Jan, 
I always thought he was like one of the study monks. He was a brilliant scholar. But he also told me once that when he was a young monk training in the island of Gotsumoi, that's where he was born, his teacher taught him how to meditate and let him meditate in a, a coconut plantation under one of the trees. And it's calm, peaceful there. And he sat for about two hours, and when he came out of meditation, he saw on his lap, called out, was a venomous snake. He knew those snakes. He was a local boy. But what he was really surprised at was that snake, even though it was very, very dangerous, he was not scared of it at all. He was so at peace with the, the snake. And the snake just was called up on his lap. The snake was happy. He was happy. And he waited for about 5, 10, 15 minutes. I cannot remember how long. And then the snake just went away. But the whole experience was, how on earth did that happen? I was so peaceful. And the snake, which would really scare me, I could just let it crawl up on my lap, very peaceful, as if it was a little puppy or a little kitten. And so that's usually what happens, even in meditation. You don't have any fear. And after you come out of meditation, if you're enlightened, you don't have any fear at all. So if I understand you correctly, you, you, an enlightened person actually does not uh, experience greed, hatred, and delusion. They don't arise in the mind at all. Correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the cause for them arising is gone. That is very specific and clear, and thank yeah. you. Now, you know, one, another interesting thing, though, is if the Buddha was fully enlightened and his teaching, you know, is very clear and it's supposed to be verifiable through personal experience, why were there so many people, even during his lifetime, his own disciples who disagreed about many things, but certainly after the Buddha we find so many different Buddhist sects with different interpretations and teachings and about the Buddha and enlightenment and this and that. Why is it so fragmented? It's because it's human nature. It was fragmented in those days. It was fragmented in these days. It'll always be fragmented because it's like in a school. You know, how many people graduate from school? Most of the people in the school you still you see are still in there, they're still learning. It doesn't lessen a person. But what happens these days is you know, we have a thing called our ego. And many people, you know, there's, there's a lot to be gained, especially in today's world, by being an enlightened Buddhist. <laughs> and if <laughs> that's why people go around saying they are. And that's I tell people that's one of the first things which will give you doubt about a person. If they say they're enlightened, then who is enlightened? Who is enlightened? Is it your body is enlightened? Your eyes are enlightened? Your nose is enlightened? You're always enlightened. Said, oh, my mind is like, what, what mind? But little by little, we sort of realize that people who come from a sense of ego, a sense of self, they're the ones who... They can fool a lot of people, and they can get a lot of benefit from that. You know, phys uh, they can get um, emotional benefit, resources, and you can get a, a livelihood. But in the end, is that a real enlightened being? Does that really make you feel that person is, is free of all craving and desires when they live in a big mansion? There was this um, guru some years ago, and I think you know this, uh, John, that uh, he once said he was so detached that he wasn't even attached to detachment, <laughs> which is a nice marketing line for his philosophy. <laughs> when you look at it, and it's this total, uh, what we call these days, bullshit. <laughs> So yes, it's okay. 
I mean, people tell me, say, why do you use those words, Ajahn Bob, bullshit? So, well, that's well, how people speak, and I understand it straight away. Well, uh, I, <laughs> I have heard you say that um, when you speak of your teacher, the Venerable Ajahn Chah, my teacher as well, um, and you have referred to him, if I'm correct, and, uh, that you, you felt that he was fully enlightened. What makes you think so? Well, if you think so, it's not even thinking as a logic. It's just uh, seeing him, being with him for such a long time. And, you know, you were with him for such a long time as well, John. But I must admit, the one thing which really tipped the scales, you know, and said, okay, I don't mind saying this to people now, was when I just, you know, you knew he could read your mind. Did he ever read your mind, John? He read mine several times. No doubt at all about that. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's, I'm not just making this up. It's real. But also, that was interesting. But the thing which really sort of tipped me was when he asked me to go and get something from his room. You know, and his, his kuti and what Papa on his hut. He would always be sitting downstairs. His upstairs was a private area. And he asked me to go and get something. And... I was really excited. Now I can see actually how he lives. I went into that room and I just, that was just one of the, the most inspiring teachings. A grass mat, a wooden pillow, and I think one robe on his line. And that was it. It was totally empty. And to see that that time, you know how famous he was and the generals and kings and, and lots of people very wealthy people, whatever he wanted, he could have. He saw what he had and there was nothing. And I thought, wow, such a famous teacher, living without hardly any possessions at all. That really just blew my mind. Hmm. And some of the other things he would definitely get away with it. I can't talk about Ajahn Chah without some of the funny stories. But when one of the, I don't know if you were there at the time, one of the generals came and asked for some holy water for Majan Chah. And Majan Chah never gave any holy water. But the general said, Oh, please, please, I really need some. So Ajahn Chah, you know, come over here. And these were some major general. They got a huge amount of power in Thailand. So this general came over, just, just bow your head. And he bowed his head in front of Ajahn Chah. I got some saliva. <laughs> All over the general's head. And then rubbed it in. <laughs> Did you see that, John? No. <laughs> oh, okay, but that happened. And we all thought that, oh my goodness, he's gone too far this time. Because you know, in Asian culture, the head is supposed to be you know, really um, very high. And you know, even when we help shave each other's heads. We always ask permission first. We go and just go around touching, you know, touching a general's head and spitting on it. And then, <laughs> and then afterwards, the general, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It's so auspicious, so lucky. Not everybody gets the, the real holy water straight from the mouth. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> and that sort of you know, also gave me that, you know, it was... Uh, Ajahn Chah's character was also very fun. And there was also very, very uh, breaking some boundaries. There was total confidence it would work. And that was why it made it really interesting to be with. Well, what about some of the other meditation masters that lived um, around the same time as Ajahn Chah? And I know you visited a number of them. Ah, yeah. And I, I do think that you have expressed some disagreement with some of the teachings of some of these so-called masters who were venerated by vast numbers of people as being enlightened as well. Yeah. Gets me into big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, some of them I thought were amazing teachers. And you know, one of the ones which I venerate to this day is uh, Ajahn Tate. Because, you know, he went to, 
the one time, I keep telling the story, but it meant so much to me. I had all these questions and I went to go and see him. And I had to, he was famous even at this time. And uh, I had to wait in line a couple of days. I got my appointment. And when I went into his room, this little man, he was tiny in stature, and in this big um, building, which was sponsored for him by uh, His Majesty the King of Thailand, he was sitting on a chair just looking over the Mekong River. Because he, he got the impression there that you know, he, he was you know, still a forest monk, just putting in a place which he didn't belong in the big luxurious room. But then when I, he turned his head to me, all my questions, they all vanished. He disappeared immediately. And I felt so stupid. I'd waited for two or three days, had all the questions there. And he was looking at me, asking, you know, want you know what question did I have? And I think I said something like, oh, you, know, you don't really need answers to the questions. You can see them for yourselves. But, oh, yeah, that's very good. And that was it. But I didn't go out voluntarily because <laughs> you felt like bathed in his peace and stillness. He didn't want to speak. We were given answers in a totally different way, that peace, that stillness, that metta. And sometimes you wonder, where will there be an end to all the questions which we have? It doesn't matter sort of what teacher you have, how smart they are. After a while, where do those questions come from? They come from a lack of peace and stillness inside. And you think those answers were going to create that peace and stillness, that satisfaction, that contentment, but they don't. I just lead to more questions until the time comes where you're peaceful and still enough. You don't need answers anymore. You see everything. So that's a beautiful, that's what Ajahn Tate told me. He's an amazing monk. Well, yeah, there's quite a few. But, you know, the other monks, I don't know because I never lived with them. You see, we judge far too easily, especially judge with negativity. Um, there's lots of great practitioners, great uh, people meditating, but they have to have the kindness there uh, and the peace and the stillness. Well, I wonder whether you are familiar with the writings of some of the mystics um, from other traditions, say Christian or Sufi or Hindu, um, that inspire you in the same way. Oh, yeah, the writings inspire me. You don't know where the person comes from. No one knows truth. They're out there in the world and see it in a... Uh, I remember this one really, really good friend who used to always tell me about um, one of the Nasruddin stories, about Nasruddin sitting next to a pile of chilies, and he'd been eating so many of them. And his friend said, why are you eating so many chilies? Look, your eyes are watering, your nose is streaming, your face is red. It must be very uncomfortable. And as Rudy said, I'm looking for the sweet one. <laughs> and I remember that was you <laughs> who taught me that, John. <laughs> Look, what a wonderful simile that is about in life. We're always looking for the sweet one. Chilies are hot. They're not sweet. <laughs> so, you know, don't. The person is not so important. Is this person enlightened, not enlightened? What's that got to do with you? What it's got to do with you is the teachings which inspire you and make you feel uh, really sort of a wonderful. I remember just one of the teachings I'm still inspired by is uh, you know, in one of the Franciscans. And this particular monk he went out one day on arms round because the Franciscan monks used to go on arms round when they were first started. And a poor person saw him and said, why are you begging for me? You know, I, I'm homeless. You've got a place to go to. You've got a nice warm robe to, to put around your body. And this monk said, oh, that's all right. And so the, he gave his robe to the beggar. And he, and that's charity. Why not? And so he, he came back to the monastery naked. And as soon as he came in and tried to get into the monastery naked, they said, get out of here. We don't have any naked freaks in our monastery. We have monks in this monastery or friars. You know, what are you trying to get in here for, you crazy person? 
I said, no, it's me. And I recognised his voice and his face. Oh, you must have been robbed. I wasn't robbed. I just gave my robe away. It's charity. And so, oh, that's really impressive. That's inspiring. But of course, the word got around the, the village, all the poor people. And so the next day, somebody else asked for his robe and he gave that as well. He came back naked a second time. And after that happened the third day, the head monk in this uh, friary said, come into my room and just really blasted him. Just gave him this little talk about, yeah, it's okay to give to others. We've only got so many robes in the storeroom. You can't give them all away. And this monk never tried to defend himself at all. He just looked down on the ground and just took the scolding. And when the abbot thought he'd taught the lesson to this monk, so he can go back now. And 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, the monk returned with a cup of soup to the abbot. What are you getting me a cup of soup for? And the monk said, look, you've been shouting at me for over an hour. Your throat must be so sore. <laughs> This monk never thought of himself at all of being scolded. He just didn't want to have the, hat, the abbot with a, with a sore throat. And so the abbot said, oh, I can't do anything about you. Give as many robes away as you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I kind of oh. like that. It's simple, to the heart, not intellectual. But that was the sort of thing which inspires me. Well, that is certainly inspiring and lovely, those characteristics and qualities of generosity, kindness, self-sacrifice are very much part of most of the spiritual traditions. But do you think that people in those traditions have also experienced the same enlightenment as the Buddha? Well, somebody once asked the Buddha that question, go to the source of it. And the Buddha said that wherever you find people practicing the Eightfold Path, you'll find enlightened beings. It's not who you are, male, female, LGBTQIA+, old or young, this um, uh, country or that country, this tradition or other tradition. It's actually what you do, actually how you practice and how you can become peaceful and quiet. That's a beautiful answer. Because it doesn't create any controversy. It's, it's for anybody, for whatever tradition, who has the, the impetus to give it a try and has enough um, experience to actually to allow it to happen. So it's an old simile for, uh, it's in all Buddhist traditions, other traditions as well, I imagine. But if you see a lake in the mountains, when there's a no wind at all, that lake is so still, it's like a mirror. And it perfectly reflects the moon and the stars in the heavens above. So do you need a tradition or a gender specific uh, or anything to actually to see the reflection of the moon and the stars in the heavens above? You need a still lake, first of all, still mind. Once that mind is still, of course, you'll be able to have the opportunity to see, see the truth. And in these traditions, maybe the Eightfold Path is not um, spelled out in the same way as in the Buddhist tradition. Would you say that that's not necessary? You don't have to spell it out correctly, as long as it's practiced. And you know what it's like afterwards. You start practicing, we think we're practicing the Eightfold Path or practicing this path or that path. And after a while, we always think my path is better than your path and all that ego stuff. But that's not the path at all. <laughs> and after a while, you just the uh, mind becomes peaceful, becomes still. And if you know that if your mind is still, and really mindful, alert. There's all these wonderful qualities to it afterwards. When it comes to the intellect, oh, people can argue for, for hours about you know the interpretation of what the Buddha said. Instead of arguing for hours, just sit cross your legs or sit on a chair or something and make your mind peaceful and still. And then actually practice. 
And if you practice it properly, the mind becomes very peaceful and still. And the meaning of all those words and ideas become very clear and you don't want to argue with anybody. You remember how Ajahn Chah would sometimes say it, when people would just, uh, they were debating on intellectual points. He said, you're right, but you're not correct. The other one is correct, they're not right. <laughs> There's a beautiful way of saying things. There's no end to trying to prove things with the ideas and concepts. So we let all of those disappear. And with it, ourselves and selves, our sense of control, our sense of ownership, and then we become peaceful. The whole idea of this person's enlightened, that person's not enlightened. They don't hold enlightenment. They just they disappeared. But listening to you, it does sound as if almost a prerequisite or an essential quality is the ability to experience that tremendous stillness and silence of mind beyond um, discursive thought. Oh, yeah. I agree to that. Very good. <laughs> but now there are, you know, um, amongst people who, and I know that that is not necessarily an easy thing to experience, but there are many people, practitioners, who can and do uh, develop that aspect of meditation to experience deep states such as that. Um, would you say that um, then, then they have very different understandings <laughs> and, and what they teach and what they present? They don't all agree on what they teach, do they? Well, sometimes uh, if there is any difference, it's just a difference of words they use to try and explain these things. But you know, sometimes if there are arguments, people are really upset, and you're not teaching the right way I am, that just is really is a, a big red sign that you know, they don't know what they're talking about. So you can usually tell if a person's got deep meditation, that's not enough for enlightenment. You can't achieve that or can't experience that enlightenment without that stillness. Mm. But you also need the wisdom, some teachings. They usually say, as you know, in the suttas, that it's the teachings of other areas, teachings of other people have become enlightened. Or at least, you know, who know what they're talking about in the stream winners. With those teaching of others and your own sort of ability to put those five hindrances aside for a while, and you don't see what you want to see. You see what's there. Now, this is an interesting thing about Buddhism, because unlike in most theistic traditions where faith and belief is so critical, uh, belief in the God or gods and having faith in, in that is quite sufficient, the Buddha did say that this enlightenment was to be experienced for oneself, that his teaching was something that was self-evident and had to be verified by oneself. That is, that's quite a, a challenge, I think, for practitioners or for Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Do you think that most Buddhist monastics take that seriously? I think they and take it a little bit too seriously is when they think they have to strive to see this. They have to make it happen. It becomes another journey of achievements by going to a university and getting graded by other people. Of course, that's never going to be the way. It's just having it, this guts, I would say, or courage, just to somehow learn how to let go and be still. You can't strive to be still. You can't just hold the body and the mind from willpower. But you can let it be. Even these days, you know, that honestly, I don't put any effort into meditating. Meditation is my rest time. We don't do things. 
So you can sit there quietly while your body's tired, lay down, make the mind really, really peaceful. No projections into the future. I want to get here, go there. No carrying the weight of the past. Keeping the mind very empty, very peaceful, very still. It gets incredibly joyful and very clear. I kept on calling, I try and make up new words, power mindfulness and superpower mindfulness. You've got the awareness there, very, very strong, but nothing moves. And very aware of what's happening. And you come out afterwards and much of that energy and power remains. Stillness that starts to disappear slowly. You can see deeper into things. And that's actually just when you start to realize that all trying to find out things. You know, trying to study this and ask questions from that master or this master or this great teacher. But after a while, it's, they've given you enough information. Now it's our time to follow that information. Make the mind very, very peaceful. Let it be peaceful. You get out of the way and let it happen. So are there fully enlightened individuals alive today? Well, quite likely. You want to know for sure? If you want to know for sure, you go and be one. <laughs> That's the only time you know for sure. <laughs> of course, there are people practicing the Eightfold Path. And as long as there's people practicing the Eightfold Path, you'll find them to be enlightened beings. And little by little, it doesn't matter, they don't have to have a brown robe on. Just whoever is practicing it properly, renouncing, living a simple life, spending lots of time, not trying to accumulate things, trying to get rid of things. I gave this one of the books which I wrote that The Art of Disappearing. The wisdom publication, or you may not be able to say that because that's an advertisement. But anyway, they, they asked for a forward. And I just, I was pretty busy as usual, but I just wrote really, really, really quickly. And I said, well, here, here's a forward for you. I know it's not going to be acceptable, but you can, I'll write another one for you later on. I said, no, we want that one. And it ended up by so wishing everybody who reads this book, please get lost. <laughs> I mean, you, your ego, your sense of self, let that disappear, get lost. <laughs> and, uh, people liked it, and I read it again. I, yeah, I can understand why they like that. Just get lost. <clears throat> Instead of become somebody. Well, there are, obviously, there are many people, and you've said that if they do claim to be enlightened, that that's a red flag already. So. <laughs> but, uh, what sort of guidelines, I mean, is it possible for, really, is it possible for an unenlightened person to, to know whether somebody is enlightened? No. You can know when a person is not enlightened. That's pretty easy to see. <laughs> but when they are enlightened or not, you know, sometimes they're just having a very peaceful, peaceful time. And sometimes it happens. When you get very, very deep meditation, when you come out afterwards, it's like you're enlightened. You just don't want anything. Nothing can harm you. You're not afraid of anything. But then, <laughs> then afterwards, something comes up. And you realize, oh, my goodness, I was upset about that. And night people don't get upset. So after a while, you're honest and says, oh, okay, yeah, maybe in close, but still got more things to do or more things to not to do. <laughs> So what advice would you give to, say, you know, students who are looking for a teacher that they could trust or should follow? What sort of guidelines, what sort of things should people consider? Well, please don't come to me. I've got too many disciples. I'm trying to live an easy life. It's time for me to retire. I'm number 70 now. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> look why do you need to go and find a teacher find teachings 
because this is a big mistake so many people make. That, you know, you go for refuge. Go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. You never go to refuge to Buddha, the Dhamma, and Ajahn Chah. Or the Buddha, Dhamma, and Ajahn Mahabha, or Buddha, Dhamma, and Guru this, or Buddha, Dhamma, and Rinpoche that. It's the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. Those are the teachers. And they should rely upon those. That's enough. And then practice what they, what they advise you, what really works for you. You feel it. And people have a lot of understanding about what peace is and how it feels. But don't go and just believe what it says in the books. Trust your own experience which is far more accurate, and be courageous. In other words, just don't just uh, follow, this must be like, no, keep testing it. And if you are uh, angry at something or you've got desire, admit it, be honest. So honesty is important. Practice is important. And don't try and impress other people. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> well, that is very beautiful advice and very, I think, very good advice. And certainly, if more of us would take it to heart, um, I think that all seekers will benefit. One last question I, I just want to ask, and it's a slightly different approach, is living as a Buddhist monk, and mainly, you know, I know you, you're very actively teaching all the time, but you are still aware of the world at large and the state of societies and the conflict. I mean, what do you, how do you relate to that, the state of the world? And what do you see you can do to help? Well, first of all, the state of the world, it's not a uh, state of our present world. Our world has always been like this. We have times of peace, times of conflict, times of uh, prosperity, times, times of poverty. You have times in your life you're healthy, times when you are sick, times when you have great relationships, times when it all goes wrong. That's our life. It's unreliable. It's impermanent, but we can learn so much from it. We can't always cure the problems of the world. We can't always care for the people who are involved in those problems. And care for both sides. Never choose one side above another side. Give care and compassion to everybody. And that goes to all human beings. All animals, we don't make exceptions. But this person is nasty, it's caused so much conflict in our world. We never think like that. They need more kindness, more understanding. That's one of the most powerful things we can do. I still remember as a kid, just reading poetry. And one of the poets was Sir William Blake. And he once said, vengeance to the tyrant fled and caught the tyrant in his bed and slew the wicked tyrant's head and became a tyrant in his stead. And that's basically Ajahn Brahm's short history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it has been really a delight and... Um, you know, it's it's a great pleasure to not only see you, but to receive these words of wisdom and, and guidance. I certainly find it inspiring um, in a strange way because it is so down to earth. I mean, it's something one I can, I can really relate to. And I hope that the other people who listen to this feel the same way as I do, whether or not they will, I don't know. 
But I certainly want to thank you so much, Ajahn Brahm, for sharing not only knowledge, but your life um, and your friendship and your guidance. On behalf of the Theosophical Society, happy birthday and thank you so much. <laughs>